for inviting me. Um, recently, we had our ACE annual meeting, and if anyone uh, listened to Dr. Fleischer's, uh uh, keynote talk. Um, I'm sure mine will pale by comparison, but I just wanted to uh, talk about some of the things um, I have learned over the years with our patients with acromegaly. I recently moved uh, to Mayo Clinic in Florida, but when I was in Houston at my prior institution, we um, served both the county as well as our private hospital there and had a, a database of approximately 200 patients. And so over the years, um, had a lot of very uh, long-standing uh, continuity of care with these patients and have learned so much from them. So um, I hope some of the information here will not be too repetitive with the excellent case uh, presentation we had prior. Dr. So these Sampton is being very modest, so if I can introduce you, please. Um, she is a senior associate consultant in the Department of Medicine, Endocrinology and Neurosurgery Brain Tumor Program, specializing in pituitary disorders. She is a fellow of the Royal College of Canada in Internal Medicine and Endocrine and uh, trained at the Baylor um, MD Anderson Cancer Center Joint Program. She was co-director of the Baylor St. Luke's Pituitary Center, having trained more than 60 endocrine fellows. She has won the Women of Excellence Award during her time at Baylor, along with uh, the Fulbright and Jaworski Faculty Excellence Awards and has served as a site principal investigator as well as international steering chair for multiple clinical trials with patients with acromegaly and Cushing's. Um, she was also the first author of the study that led to FDA approval of the first oral medication for treatment of acromegaly. And for all of those who published, she's the associate editor of the journal Pituitary. So you really want to be in her good books for that. Um, she has, has also has a wonderful career, career in education, along with being in the ACGME, in the ABIM, has served on Pituitary Society, Endocrine Society, and ACE committees. And uh, I'm going to stop there so that she can start her presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So you have before you the objectives today. Um, just wanting to remind us all about medical therapies. Um, if we have time, discuss some pipeline therapies that are coming and, and really think about how each of those therapies can be used in taking a personalized approach to our patients with acromegaly. So we all are aware of the burden of acromegaly. Um, the U.S. prevalence is probably around 25,000. Um, and we have patients that manifest some or all of these changing characteristics uh, systemically. These are actual pictures of uh, some of my prior patients. Um, when I was in Houston, we can see uh, outwardly changes in their features, enlargement of visceral organs internally. Of course, we have um, the progression of metabolic disease with insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, diabetes, and hypertension. Patients can suffer from chronic pain due to osteoarthritis and joint and muscle pain. And um, as uh, the fellow was presenting her case with the guidelines from 2014, I think we've come to know more now that there is also an, a large impact on a bone disease, especially vertebral um, fractures in these patients. So we have to be aware of that when we are thinking about how we would um, follow up on a patient that's newly diagnosed. Patients suffer from headaches, often from local growth hormone elevations, fatigue, changes in the skin, including oily skin and skin tags. Of course, we have to monitor for uh, colon neoplasia. And here's my hand next to one of my patients from the clinic. Um, they have enlargement of the hands and feet that um, are one of the important signs that they've had disease for quite a long time, requiring both bone and tissue growth. So I wanted to start with the case um, from 2014, and I inherited this case, um, but it illustrates a number of important points. So she had an incidentally discovered macroadenoma um, that was done on an MRI, uh, was found on an MRI for memory issues. Um, she had a past surgical history of a hysterectomy um, with removal of the ovaries at 45 years. She'd gained some weight, but had recently been on a weight loss program, and she had a diagnosis of uh, mixed connective tissue disorder on Plaquenil. And so this was her, her adenoma when first assessed. And you can see here, I hope the fellows all look at their imaging, but you can see here this um, 
this hypo intensity or hypo enhancement in the cella. And so at the time, because it was not affecting the chiasm above, the option was for monitoring her. Her labs showed a prolactin of, of 13, so this was not a prolactinoma. Her IGF-1 was within normal limits for her age and sex, and she had not manifested hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency in her workup. And so she was, um, you know, released from the clinic to come back one year later. And in 2015, you can see that the IGF-1 was now 323, and by normalizing to the to the upper limit of normal, had now risen above the range. And so at that time, I think the question was, well, this is probably a false positive. Um, let's repeat that, and there it is again. And so this kind of early normal IGF-1, I think, colored the way this patient was um, was dealt with in follow-up. So in thinking about why that could happen, why would you go from a normal range IGF-1 to uh, one that is now far above the normal range? And I think we have to think about it on two levels. It's it's either the assay or it's it's the tumor. And so in this, this is an actual laboratory testing from a patient of mine showing that um, when we use LCMS assays, which are probably what you have at the Cleveland Clinic, we certainly do have that at Mayo Clinic, versus immunoassays, you can run into real problems in interpreting IGF-1 um, in, in this particular patient, always looking elevated, but when done at the same time by LCMS, you can see that there are two uh, ranges actually, the two values actually agree, but the reference ranges um, were given differently from the two labs. And so for the fellows, I would just encourage you, if possible for your patients, to always use an LCMS. And for those that have to have their labs done remotely, whether for video visits or um, um, other reasons, I think uh, I will have my patients go to Quest uh, because they do perform this assay by this by this means. But in our patient's case, um, she was having her labs done continually at Mayo Clinic through LCMS. And so at this point, um, the thought was, well, let's do a growth hormone suppression test. And um, this was very nicely explained in the prior case conference. Our ultra-sensitive growth hormone assay, uh, Irina Bankos has determined that the suppression level should be 0.5. And so you can see in this patient, she did achieve hyperglycemia and her growth hormone did suppress below 0.5 in this particular case. And so at that point, uh, there was no further uh, work done regarding her IGF-1 elevation. But as you can see, she was lost to follow-up for approximately three years after 2017, and by 2020, we now have an IGF-1 that is two times the upper limit of normal, and now her growth hormone suppression test um, is now suppressing down to 0.6. And I think a lot of um, endocrinologists may also still be using a cutoff of one, which as pointed out in the previous presentation is not appropriate uh, to diagnose or to rule out that we have growth hormone hypersecretion. And so at this point, thinking about what happened here, it's very interesting, um, as Dr. Kennedy brought up, the estrogen has a huge impact on how women produce IGF-1 in response to growth hormone. And that is really because of the inhibition of the JAK-STAT pathway that is required for growth hormone signaling to increase IGF-1 production. And in part, this is due to decreased phosphorylation of JAK2 um, and signal transduction. And so because of that, patients um, who are on estrogen supplements uh, will have lower IGF-1. And the occurrence in this patient here, let me just pull her labs back here, um, was that she, after her hysterectomy, was on estrogen replacement that was then stopped um, prior to this lab. And so possibly her oral estrogen was suppressing her IGF-1, leading to um, a normal IGF-1 here. And when she came off the estrogen, her IGF-1 started to manifest uh, with the uh, realization that this likely has been a growth hormone secreting tumor uh, 
throughout her course, which brings up an important point about delays in diagnosis for female patients. So if I pull up her MRI here, this was at the time of her diagnosis. We see progression of this adenoma slowly in 2020. Um, and this patient then underwent resection with the understanding that this was a growth hormone tumor. And postoperatively, even just within one month, we see the normalization of the IGF-1 and the random growth hormone on post-op day one was 0.4, which portends remission in this patient. She will need to be monitored as well. And just in case you think that's a single, a single one-off case, this was a patient I saw two months ago who had had um, a three-year history of symptoms of debilitating joint pains, muscle aches. She'd had a neurology workup for paresthesias, a cardiology workup um, for palpitations. She'd had several polyps and colonoscopy. And three years prior, one of her primary care doctors had thought of IGF-1, performed an IGF-1 that was three times the upper limit of normal, and yet this, this value was never followed up on repeat and no imaging was performed. Because all of this manifested when she stopped her estrogen-containing oral contraceptives, the thought was, well, I must need more estrogen. And so she had asked her physician to put her back on replacement and that IGF-1 came down from three times the upper limit of normal to 1.7. But as she progressed over the years, she had worsening snoring. And in spite of the fact that her BMI was really in a healthy range at 21, she had increased shoe size and a change in her bite as well. And she didn't have a lot of really obvious features of, of acromegaly. Um, she did have some increased finger width, maybe some palmer sweating, and some mild prognathism, but she didn't have any broadened nose, thickened skin, or lips. And if you look at her growth hormone level here, it was 37 in the clinic, and as well, um, her IGF-1 was two times the upper limit of normal, here on estrogen therapy, whereas it had been closer to a thousand um, off of estrogen therapy. And this was her tumor. This is the first time she'd ever been imaged in five years after the initial elevation of IGF-1. And um, certainly this is a tumor that we would um, take out as first line therapy. And she did have that surgery. Here you can see the clear surgical cavity, the um, the maintenance of the gland here by the surgeon, which is wonderful. And you can see her post-op IGF-1 starts to fall. And in fact, we haven't even had our three-year follow-up, uh, three-month follow-up with her. So I'll be excited to see where she is at. Within one week of her surgery, she noticed that a lot of her arthralgias and myalgias had started to, to resolve. And she had no post-operative complications or diabetes insipidus. So this, this important point was raised in the last talk. There are gender differences in uh, the presentation of acromegaly. There seems to be a mild female preponderance. Somewhere around 56% of patients in population studies will be, will be women, but that varies. And there's definitely a delay in diagnosis with males being diagnosed more in their 40s, females in the 50s. Um, with at least a, around a five-year delay for women, whether that is related to their estrogen status um, needs further teasing out from the data, but it is really important to, to think about this in our female patients. Uh, we know that quality of life scores are lower in women, and as brought up in the last talk, they tend to have larger and more invasive tumors, perhaps because of the delay in diagnosis and the IGF-1 lower relative to the growth hormone than men. We see more diabetes and hypertension in women um, and less sleep apnea than men, although men, um, the sleep apnea rates or prevalence in, in male patients with acromegaly may be similar to the population and uh, related to BMI. Dr. Samson, we have a question in the chat. Uh, would sure. You growth hormone to increase with estrogen and IGF-1 to decrease with estrogen? Um, that's an excellent question. It, it makes me wonder if you decrease the feedback on the tumor with IGF-1, whether that would be true. I don't know of any data that shows that, but certainly if these tumors are larger and more invasive, they may be producing more growth hormones. So that would be 
uh, something you would see on the patient's labs. Okay, thank you. So I want to move into a second case after just illustrating this. This also is a female patient um, of mine who is a teacher in Colorado. And over the years, she had uh, developed a number of new symptoms, including skin tag, hair loss, um, amenorrhea. She had a large tongue and difficulty with speech, which is really what brought her to medical attention because she was a teacher. Um, she's snoring and a diagnosis of sleep apnea. Her ring size had increased, her shoe size had increased, and she had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, knee pain, and uncontrolled diabetes with a very high hemoglobin A1C on, on insulin. And at her pre-op values were a very high growth hormone of almost 26. Her IGF-1 was four and a half times the upper limit of normal. And so we can see this very uh, dangerous invasive tumor here. And I, I picked this particular MRI because one of the things that my neurosurgeon at the time brought up with me is that this is a highly vascular tumor. He was an excellent surgeon and for the most part would be able to achieve uh, full uh, removal of tumors in many cases. But in this case, he was not co really confident in the sense that um, she had a lot of vascularity within the tumor and he needed to be extremely careful in trying to remove this or debulk it. So perhaps in 2020 hindsight, this might be the type of case where you would say we should be pre-treating or primary therapy with medication. And certainly after one month after surgery, you can see that she still has a very large amount of residual tumor. This was a mixed growth hormone and prolactin cell adenoma, which we see quite often. But what we don't always see is, you know, this comment on neuronal metaplasia. So this is a unusual tumor producing high amounts of growth hormone. And so we can see here in a pre-op values that after the surgery, he did debulk a substantial part of this tumor because you can see this growth hormone drop down to post-op month one, although it is still in the range of 12 here. And we see this huge differential between the fact that the IGF-1 has not budged. It's still four and a half to five times the upper limit of normal. And for the fellows, um, it's important to remember that uh, often IGF-1 production from the liver is really maximized um, at certain levels of growth hormone. You know, there's this exponential relationship. And at some point, you just can't make any more IGF-1. Those receptors, growth hormone receptors are saturated. And so you may see this lovely drop in growth hormone, but you may still uh, maintain this very high IGF-1 level. And it requires time to drop, as was pointed out in the last uh, case session. Um, many of our guidelines talk about waiting at least three months to know where the patient is at, uh, especially if you expect a cure. I think in a tumor as large as this one with the amount of residual, starting treatment as soon as possible is very important. So what tools do we have to treat her? So we have discussed this briefly in the previous session, but um, somatostatin receptor ligands, cabergoline, both of which are directed at growth hormone secretion and the tumor. And I think in, in at least for sure with somatostatin receptor ligands, there's the potential for tumor shrinkage, which could be very important in this woman with a large residual tumor that is impacting her brain as well as her optic chiasm. Cabergoline as well, thinking about the fact that she has a mild uh, prolactin, uh, she has some prolactin staining in the tumor. Radiation in some patients, in her case, this would not be appropriate given how much residual tumor she has and the potential impact on the optic nerve if she was exposed to radiation. Of course, her very high IGF-1 levels might benefit from pegvisamont. And as uh, was raised, uh, some of the estrogen um, agonists, antagonists can also be, be used in mild cases to control the IGF-1 production. If we think about cabergoline um, in, in this particular case, it's probably not the best choice as monotherapy. About 30% of patients with um, acromegaly will respond to uh, cabergoline as a treatment. And sometimes higher doses than the usual 0.5 twice a week we use for prolactinomas are required. 
And we know that patients, if they have a mild elevation of IGF-1 here, under 150% times the upper limit of normal, they have a better chance of response. IGF, uh, cabergoline as monotherapy is probably more successful in patients who have prolactin co-staining and dopamine 2 receptors are likely there. When added to a somatostatin receptor ligand, it's a little more successful. And of course, over the last few years, we have begun to understand more about the impact on valve disease, which is probably a little more relevant in acromegaly patients who might be on higher doses than prolactinoma patients. And, and even more so now, the impact that these uh, agents can have in a small subset of patients who may have impulse control disorders. It's very important that we counsel our patients on this. I had a recent um, patient who was on cabergoline for a prolactinoma who had had a reemergence of her uh, addiction to huffing and was very confused by the fact that for five years she had no issues with trying to control that until she was started on cabergoline. When I explained to her uh, that it was a potential side effect of the drug, she she was somewhat relieved that that we could stop the drug and she could get back into control of her addiction and we would look at a surgical solution for her prolactinoma. So very important for the fellows to be aware of these impacts um, and also to counsel your patients. It'll be few and far between, 5%, but you never want to miss the one patient that may have issues because of this. And this was a recent study uh, that Dr. Flesheru published just looking at impact of cabergoline versus uh, drug-naive patients uh, in terms of depression and using a Barrett impulsivity scale, which looks at impulse control. The um, results were um, not very robust, but it certainly showed that there can be an increase in both of these uh, issues in our patients on dopamine agonists. So just to be aware. In terms of other choices, so we've had some recent meta-analysis which have nicely uh, teased out the impact of pegvisimont in our patients. As Dr. Kennedy pointed out, the clinical trials, uh, you know, you can continue to increase pegvisimont to get control of that IGF-1, but in real life, uh, perhaps we have some inertia in increasing that dose. Um, but we do know there are positive impacts on fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C overall in patients. So glycemic control can improve. And um, in part, this is because we know that growth hormone increases insulin resistance, but IGF-1 does not. And in fact, IGF-1 has a very minor affinity for the uh, for the insulin receptor, probably one in a thousand decreased affinity. But there can also be heterodimerization of IGF-1 receptors with insulin receptors. So really growth hormone is the culprit. So when you block growth hormone with pegvisimont, you can see that improvement in glycemic control. The other thing we, you know, we're always monitoring liver tests in our patients on pegvisimont, but in in these meta-analyses, elevated liver enzymes were very minor. And of course, we worry about removing feedback on the tumor with IGF-1, and 7% of patients had mild enlargements of their tumor, whether that's just the characteristic of their particular tumor or the reduction in feedback isn't clear. But I think that this uh, is reassuring for those of us who use pegvisimont as a single agent in our patients. And of course, we can use combination therapies. These are not FDA approved, but um, we know that if you add cabergoline to pegvisimont, uh, here's, pardon me, pegvisimont to cabergoline, here is the impact of cabergoline in, in individual uh, acromegaly patients in this study with Dr. Trainer and adding pegvisimont, uh, you know, continues to improve the IGF-1 in these patients. And the fact that cabergoline is having an impact, even though we're using pegvisimont here, is shown by the fact that when cabergoline is stopped in these patients, you can see a rise in a subset of patients in their IGF-1. So combinations can be effective in our patients. And of course, in our patient here with a very large tumor, I would propose to you that somatostatin receptor ligands are really the first line here. 
um, the growth hormone tumors express many or most of the somatostatin receptor um, receptors, but two and five being the most important. And of course, those are the ones that are targeted by the first generation of somatostatin receptors. The control of um, patients with acromegaly in terms of IGF-1 and growth hormone you know, it's probably a little lower than we used to think it is. If you go through the different studies here, really patients who achieved control of both IGF-1 and growth hormone in clinical trial settings is running around 30% in some of these trials. Here's a one that's maybe achieving up to 60. And so I think the success with the somatostatin, first generation somatostatin receptor ligand is a little less than we sometimes quote in the literature. And so with our patient, what are we going to recommend? Well, as I said, I think in her case, uh, starting a long-acting injectable SRL would be the first line here. And that's what we did at the time. We didn't wait the requisite three months, given how much tumor she had here. She has octreotide 20, octreotide 30. We're seeing a little bit of response from growth hormone, but um, at some point, uh, we have to think about whether we're going to increase the octreotide LAR to 40. Do we switch to passereotide, add cabergoline, or add pegvisimon? And uh, the choice I made at the time was to add cabergoline, a very good dose. You start to see this impact on the growth hormone, remembering that here it's still around 10. And we've continued the octreotide and now she's on cabergoline at 3.5 milligrams per week, which is the maximum I tend to use in these patients, and we still haven't achieved control. But we're getting closer. We can see now we're at IGF-1 about two and a half times the upper limit of normal. So the issue, though, is in spite of starting to gain control in her biochemistry, we still have substantial residual tumor here, even on octreotide 30, with cabergoline 3.5 per week and 12 months of therapy. And here is the sagittal as well, showing some shrinkage in the superior portion of this tumor, but still substantial residual tumor. So what do we do now? Well, I think um, what your fellow presented very nicely about some of the clues we can have in our patients as to how they're going to respond to somatostatin receptor ligands. Um, I put here the easy way and the hard way. Um, when you look at the MRI, um, looking at T2 hyperintensity, uh, which would you can compare the tumor itself on T2 and the intensity to that of the gray matter. If it's isointense or hyperintense, that may portend sparse granulation of this tumor and a lesser response to first generation somatostatin receptor ligands. Um, high KI67 low SSTR2 or somatostatin 2 receptor can also uh, give you clues as to how this patient may respond. There are other um, markers that are throughout the literature really being used in a research capacity at this time, but I think at some point we'll have uh, an ability to predict who might benefit uh, from additional therapies. This is a really nice paper. I like the way they showed this here. This is a, uh, a tumor with lower T2 intensity, dense granulation. You can see here the adenoma compared to gray matter uh, has much less T2 intensity versus this tumor here, which looks a lot like the gray matter in intensity and is sparsely granulated. And they compare the sparse granulation and the response to somatostatin receptor ligands first generation and find them to be reduced in those patients that have the T2 hyperintensity sparse granulation. So in our patient, the teacher from Colorado, you can see that this is T2 hyperintense. And um, thinking about whether or not passereotide would be the right choice for her, we, um, we do see um, in de novo patients or patients that have gone to surgery but have never been exposed before in a head-to-head -head comparison that you can achieve um, moderately more control, disease control in patients using passereotide. Of course, these patients were not selected for dense or sparse granulation. These were just patients who'd come through surgery or were being treated as primary therapy. 
And certainly the Paola study also showed that patients who were not controlled on octreotide or landreotide, if they were switched to passereotide, they gained better control of their IGF-1, although it's not completely normalized here, versus continuing on the same therapy. And that was certainly borne out in the Paola extension, which if patients were continued in the extension up to 5.8 years, you can even see that after a year, if the IGF-1 is not perfectly controlled, over time, you start to see further response of the tumor to passereotide. And for those in the octreotide group that were crossed over and still not controlled in the original six-month core, again, they achieve more control. So, <coughs> pardon me, passereotide is an option um, for our patients that are not fully controlled. Of course, it is a cyclic um, um, peptide, and it is. Uh, it was very interesting how this was discovered. It was a rational drug design where they were uh, substituting alanines throughout the, the uh, somatostatin amino acid backbone to really look at affinity for the somatostatin receptors. And, and so um, it was found to have a much higher affinity for the somatostatin receptor 5 here. The lower the number, of course, is more inhibition. And so that's what makes it a little different from the first generation ligands and why in some tumors you see a better response. In our patient, just adding the lowest dose here of passereotide at 40, you start to see her gain control. And of course, this was titrated up as soon as possible. And we're almost at an IGF-1 of 1 in this patient. And as, as, as well, if you look at the tumor uh, shrinkage with only 40 and 60 at three months. Now we're 18 months out from her surgery and you can see the shrinkage of this tumor. And here it is on the coronal views. Um, so you can see what has happened after deciding to switch over to uh, a more potent choice here. So what would be the impact here though? There's a trade-off, right? Uh, will her insulin requirements go up? Remember she had uncontrolled diabetes on insulin. Um, Will she have a worsened hemoglobin A1C? Will her insulin requirements decrease? Or maybe there will be no effect. And we certainly know from uh, the clinical trials that one of the major side effects, and, and one of the things I think that um, discourages uh, endocrinologists from using passereotide in a subset of patients is the concern about the high rates of hyperglycemia and diabetes that were seen in these trials. Yeah, we see increase in the fasting blood glucose within the first few weeks of initiation of therapy. We see an increase in the hemoglobin A1C, um, and certainly in the PAPE study as well, um, we saw increases in hemoglobin A1C as well. And, and I think what is a little discouraging about this data is that the addition of pegvisimont could not take away from that hyperglycemia. And I think that makes um, physiologic sense problem with passereotide is an insulin secretion problem. Pegvisimont may help to improve uh, insulin resistance, but it isn't solving the insulin problem. And how do we know that? We know that from healthy volunteer studies. So in these patients that were treated with passereotide for seven days, um, this was their original glucose tolerance test. And then seven days on passereotide, you can see the impact on the area under the curve of glucose and the suppression of the insulin secretion. And this was really attributed in part to beta cell um, suppression, but there is a huge impact on the incretin response in these patients uh, with both GLP-1 and GIP being dampened. Glucagon also dampens a bit, uh, which would be a positive thing for glycemic control, but it's not enough to overcome what you're seeing with the incretins here. So this is not an insulin resistance problem. This is an incretin problem. And, um, you know, this is a very important part of our physiology. The incretin effect is responsible for approximately 70% of our insulin secretion after a meal. So you can imagine that dampening that response has a big impact. So if we need to use passereotide, how do we treat it? Um, certainly um, this healthy volunteer follow-up study showed that metformin can help a bit. Um, and if you think rationally, a DPP-4 inhibitor 
or a GLP-1 receptor agonist should have a positive impact, especially the uh, receptor agonist used here. And you can see that there is an improvement, although not normalization of the glycemic curve. Um, I wrote this uh, algorithm a few years ago. I would probably write it differently now because the use of a DPP-4 inhibitor, which requires the uh, secretion of GLP-1, of endogenous GLP-1 to have an impact, if your GLP-1 is low, how much impact can that really have? And so I think uh, one of the possibilities is to consider a GLP-1 receptor agonist in the patients who manifest hyperglycemia. Um, this paper uh, was, is just in press right now with pituitary, but um, in this particular kind of proof of principle study, incretin therapy, which included a GLP-1 receptor um, agonist, was able to improve glycemic control in patients started on passoreotide that had an increase in their hemoglobin A1C. So I think I think um, that may be one option for dealing with the hyperglycemia in the patients where you need this agent. Um, but for my patient, what was interesting is as you started to control her IGF-1, you can see that her, in, her uh, hemoglobin A1C actually improves and her need for insulin in terms of units per day improve. And I hear arguments from some endocrinologists, I'm not going to use passoreotide on that patient because they already have diabetes and they're on insulin. If the patient doesn't have beta cell secretion, they're not using their endogenous GLP-1 per se, and they, they're not producing enough insulin endogenously and they're on it, the control of their growth hormone using this agent can actually decrease their insulin requirements. So it's important to think about what the glycemic issues are in your patient. Um, are they just glucose intolerant? That patient may worsen on passoreotide. Are they already diabetic on insulin? That patient may improve as you control their disease. And so I think that's a really important uh, consideration, consideration, considering the insulin-dependent patient or what is the baseline glucose tolerance of your patient and making rational choices for treatment if hyperglycemia does manifest. So I just want to uh, end with another case. This is a 50-year-old patient who is a lawyer. Um, and he has a new diagnosis of snoring, uh, has had a sleep study showing obstructive sleep apnea, and had some facial feature changes that um, had, had gone undetected, including prominent lips, widening of the nasal bridge, some mild soft tissue enlargement, but importantly, headaches, which is why the imaging was done. You can see here his macroadenoma, perhaps some invasion in the sphenoid here. Um, his pituitary is pushed over to the right and above the mass. Um, and so he had surgery. Uh, you can see here his pre-op IGF-1. He did have a, a growth hormone suppression test that was clearly abnormal with a growth hormone that did not suppress uh, 2.4. And he underwent surgery. Um, this was actually um, a tumor that it looks really, here's the post-op film. It looks completely resected, but as you dig a little deeper into the MRI scrolling through, you can see that there is some cavernous disease here, this hypoenhancing tissue uh, that can still be a culprit. And sure enough, um, at initially he had just a mild elevation of his IGF-1, but his growth hormone was still, random growth hormone was still above one. He had improvement in his uh, post-op glucose tolerance test, but this really didn't motivate starting therapy. And, um, I, you know, I inherited this patient later, but I will say that you can see his growth hormone here postoperatively random, and it's starting to rise at one and a half years after the surgery. You also see the IGF-1 is always hovering above one, and really I think our goal should be below one. There are conversations in the field where, um, Maybe we should let it kind of wobble up to 1.3, but I think in this patient's case, he was still having symptoms that this needs to be treated no matter how mild this looks to us as the physician. And so what would be our next step? Well, I don't think watchful waiting is another option is an option here. Reoperation in this patient with cavernous disease, I don't think that this has 
potential, although maybe debulking a small part of that cavernous disease, if, if you can get some of it on the, on the inferior part might help. He would be a good candidate for stereotactic radiosurgery, and we do use this in our patients, especially cavernous disease when it's far away from the gland. There's still a risk of hypopituitarism in about 30 to 50 percent. Um, we can control the growth hormone in, in many patients, up to 90 percent with this, or do we start a medical therapy? Um, in this case, the, the choice initially was a somatostatin receptor ligand, just a low dose, and he did uh, quite well with that, almost immediately responding with an IGF-1 below the upper limit of normal growth hormone of 0.3, but really tired of the injections. And so I think uh, in the past year, we've um, had the privilege of having yet another option for our patients. Um, we know that we may be, think we're winning with a normal IGF-1, but what patients perceive in terms of their treatment for acromegaly um, they can have pain from the injections and scar tissue, nodule swelling. Um, remembering these patients have to schedule this injection every month. Um, they can miss work days. They can have absences from work. As much as I always try to use a nurse home injection, um, nurse home injection program, it can be uh, challenging. And so, of course, this changes their independence. I've had patients call and say, I'm supposed to be on vacation. I'm supposed to be getting my injection with with some, some concern about the impact on their disease. And there are some patients that also at the end of the injection period can experience breakthrough symptoms. Um, I've, I've never done this myself, but I've had colleagues who have added short acting octreotide in the last week before the injection because of these breakthrough symptoms that can occur as the depot treatments wear off. So really as was raised in the last, uh, the last talk, the new kid on the block oral octreotide um, it's just such an interesting technology that will probably be harnessed for other small peptides, and it has transient permeability enhancer, which really causes transient opening of the tight junctions in the intestine, allowing this very small molecule to go through. It still excludes pathogens. Um, and so by doing this, you can absorb the octreotide orally, and you can compare here the pharmacokinetic curves of octreotide. You can see here subcutaneous is a pretty early peak, but the oral is there. And in fact, the area under the curve is a little bit superior using the capsules and the half-life is extended slightly longer. So of course this is required to be given twice a day. Um, the trials, uh, it was interesting politically because the trials, including the optimal trial, I think Dr. Kennedy would have been involved in both of these trials as well, but the EMPOWER trial was the original to look at uh, oral octreotide compared to injectable SRLs, really a non-inferiority study. Uh, the EMA accepted this as a design, but the OPTIMAL trial, the FDA wanted to see a placebo um, control, which is challenging when you have a known treatment ethically for a disease, but the empowered study was halted, and so the optimal trial could be completed for uh, further FDA approval of this drug. And what was unique about this, of course, is if you have a placebo, you've got to let the patients go back on therapy as they have reemergence of their symptoms or the IGF-1 in either the treatment or the placebo group. Of course, investigators and patients were blinded. And so this was the rescue that was used in this trial to ensure that patients did not lose control of their disease at the time. And the IGF-1 was really maintained within the mean for the whole group and rose in the placebo. The primary endpoint, um, so patients were tightly controlled coming into the trial. They had to have two IGF-1s at one or below the upper limit of normal, which is a little more stringent than past trials, which have used 1.3. And so the other point here is that um, when they were tested, they were only tested at uh, weeks 34 and 36, rather than throughout the trial with a time-weighted average of IGF-1. And so there have been uh, you know, discussions around how do you have such a high rate of placebo where these patients actually in remission from their disease when you remove the somatostatin receptor ligand. But if you actually looked at the individual curves of these patients, which I had access to, um, they really rose above the upper limit of normal several times in the course of the trial. They happened to be controlled at weeks 34 and 36. And so 
actually all five were put into the extension by their blinded investigators after seeing their IGF-1 profiles and not knowing if they were on study drug or not. So, so that was an interesting twist. Um, and also 68% uh, of patients on placebo needed rescue, that rescue treatment in the trial versus 25 on the capsules. The side effects as mentioned in the previous presentation, very, very similar to to the uh, what we already know about s s injectable somatostatin ligands and really gastrointestinal. One thing that was interesting in this trial is on the capsules, uh, you know, we can see that in placebo, those adverse events of special interest, which are really acromegaly symptoms, headache, perspiration, joint pain, really escalated in those patients on the placebo treatment. Um, and the gastrointestinal ad adverse events were transient. So really no new safety signals. We recently reported the extension data um, and looked at the maintenance of control. 20 uh, patients from each the placebo and the oral octreotide groups opted to go into the extension. And so that uh, was, was good to see that the, there was maintenance of control um, over the longer extension um, of 48 weeks and that the placebo group then came into the normal range. So... Um, and if you if you've used this wonderful, I, the initiation of the dosage is at 20 milligrams twice a day, empty stomach, or it will uh, not be absorbed at least one hour before a meal or two hours after a meal. And patients should have shown some response to octreotide or lenreotide. I'm currently using this in patients who have control with octreotide or lenreotide. Um, and it can be titrated very quickly every two weeks, not like every three months with the injectables. So you can gain rapid control in these patients. And for special considerations, you want to think about uh, mild suppression of TSH. Uh, acid uh, reduction in acid in the stomach can decrease absorption. And we can see increased QT prolongation as we can with the injectable somatostatin receptor ligands. And of course, gallbladder issues as well, because it's still the same type of drug. Um, this slide is just to indicate that in the extension, patients were actually started on 60 rather than 40 milligrams and had less AEs, suggesting that perhaps if we get control of that disease early uh, with a higher dose, we may actually do better for our patients. So the FDA approved starting dose is 40, but there are some clinicians who are actually starting patients at 60 right now. So I don't want to go over. Um, if you want to read more, we recently updated the Pituitary Society Management to include recommendations here. And I wrote this section with Dr. Molich um, based on the data. And so um, in terms of future choices, I'll be really brief here. Um, the somatostatin analog market is $2 billion annually. So you can imagine that pharma really wants to get in there. And we are certainly seeing development of novel deliveries of octreotide, oral, intranasal, uh, crystal matrixes, even subcutaneous pumps, and then also novel molecules that still harness the somatostatin receptor uh, you know, activities. So somatoprim being a subcutaneous uh, injection that activates, uh, including somatostatin receptor 4, and uh, paltocetine, I'm not involved in these trials, but this is an oral medication that is in, uh, in trials right now looking at control of growth hormones. So there may be the opportunity to have another oral medication in the pipeline here. So I'm going to slip, slip through these. Uh, final is uh, using uh, antisense RNA to the growth hormone receptor. So this would be like pegvisimont. So there's decreased receptor expressed on the hepatocyte, and therefore you downregulate the ability of growth hormone to activate production of IGF-1. And so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. So I think we have the opportunity here to think about our patients, the different types of medications we now have available, and this has really expanded over the last, dec next, the last decade, and to personalize each of these, uh, each of these medicines in a way uh, that is appropriate for our patients, thinking about their lifestyle, their glycemic control, cost considerations, their remnant tumor 
and whether they are um, resistant. So with that, I'm going to going to finish off um, and say thank you very much. Sorry, I was didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but I will end there. Thank you so much, Dr. Samson. That was a wonderful presentation. It's a great uh, um, talk for our first year fellows who are just starting out, as well as a great update for clinical endocrinologists who might not be seeing acromegaly so often, but might be seeing it here or there on how to manage. Um, I think I would like to point out here that Dr. Samson also touched on some of the questions that would be um, useful for the boards. Things like uh, the glycemic control with pasteurotide or uh, checking IGF-1 not so early after surgery, but waiting maybe up to three months and at least six weeks uh, to think about cure versus not a cure yet. Um, I'm going to open this to now the audience to see if you have any questions or comments. Maybe we can start with our panel. Uh, Dr. Yogi Muran. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue. It's great seeing you, and thank you for this excellent talk. <laughs> um, you know, your, on your last slide, you know, um, you know, we're talking that we now have all these different options, you know, to treat acromegaly, and it's important to come up with a personalized approach, you know, for each patient. So I wanted to ask you, how do you ask for things like somatostatin receptor subtype um, on your pathology, you know, of course, we always have the granulation pattern, and from the MRI, you can see T2 hyperintensity, as you showed in one of your cases. How much should we be trying to personalize our approach based on these three things that are known to sort of, I don't want to say predict, but might respond better to certain therapies? Because I think we, as Dr. Kennedy said in one of his earlier comments, because we do this trial and failure method or trial and assess method with acromegaly and then these medications are not covered and it's a long process to delay treatment. Right. And, you know, how can we kind of shorten this and use these factors that we know have a, some predictive value in response to treatment so that we can treat these patients faster and more effectively with some of these newer agents? I mean, I think that is really the challenge. I think we still think about, for example, in the passereotide example, that we we treat to failure uh, a little bit in some patients. I learned my lesson with that patient. I had another patient soon after her that refused surgery at a very large invasive tumor. And in his case, um, we didn't have pathology, but we had the T2 appearance on MRI and went straight to passereotide and gained control of that tumor with significant shrinkage. So I think um, in certain cases, it it's okay to leap forward. It's also important to remember that um, T2 hyperintensity and sparse granulation do not mean that 100% of patients won't respond. It means that you need to uh, really titrate in a timely fashion and consider um, putting together combinations. It, it, when patients have large tumors, I really do not feel comfortable not having them on a somatostatin receptor ligand. Um, but if the IGF-1 is just not getting under control, adding um, adding pegvisimod or adding cabergoline, I find the, the synergism between those two medications to be uh, very helpful. Um, but we do need to titrate up the cabergoline. It can't, you know, you can't just sit at the lowest dose. I've seen acromegaly patients on 0.25 twice a week, and that's not going to cut it in many of our patients. Probably have decreased receptor density and, and response. So um, I agree with you. We do seem to have a lot of treatment inertia. Um, and I think pegvisimod is a great agent to really escalate um, the dose and get IGF-1 under control. And we should be using a lot more combinations in these patients that are controlled rather than just letting them grumble along. So, uh, Thank you, Sue. Uh, Dr. Kennedy. Um, He's frozen. Yeah, I think he lost an... Oh. There he is. You need to unmute yourself. Ned, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Sue, for a super talk. Uh, and I particularly want to thank you for emphasizing that we should be aiming to get the IGF-1 less than one times the upper limit of normal. Mm -hmm. uh, as you pointed out, in some clinical trials, uh, intervention or rescue 
uh, comes in only at 1.3 times the upper limit of normal. But I've certainly seen patients, and I'm sure you have as well, who despite getting IGF-1 just down below the upper limit of normal still have significant symptoms. And if you want to talk about individualizing treatment, then I think you need to look at that. And sometimes you need to really work to get the IGF-1 even considerably lower than that. But that was a, a wonderful talk and it's very nice to see you. And I'm glad you're settling into your new position. Thank you. I, can I just make one small comment? I completely agree with Dr. Kennedy and, and for the fellows, I've you know, it's hard when patients still have ed- headache or joint aches and you have the IGF-1 controlled. But I had a patient with a normal IGF-1 on pegvisimont who had objective growth of his jaw. And that was documented by the dentist. And so that normal range for him is not his normal range as an individual. So really listening to the patient and in some cases pushing them down into the mid-normal range of IGF-1 may still help to relieve some of their symptoms and some of the devastating biologic effects that happen from growth hormone excess. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right. I don't think we have any questions or comments in the chat. Dr. Samson, I think everybody's still digesting the wonderful data and is still in awe of your talk. That's why we, are, <laughs> we don't have a lot of comments yet. It was a little speedy. <laughs> <laughs> it was, honestly, it was great. Um, I did my fellowship a decade ago and I think I have really enjoyed it. Dr. Kennedy, do you have another comment? Oh, no. Okay. You still have a raise hand. But thank oh, you so sorry. much. And we will see you guys all July 28th. Uh, we are talking about T3 replacement and treatment of hypothyroidism. So a pretty controversial topic from Dr. Antonio Bianco from University of Chicago. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you. Bye.